Hi guys, welcome back to Chaz's No Bullshit Reptile Advice. Uh, today's question comes from Brian Simonson. I love what you were doing. Listening has gotten me motivated to get back into keeping after taking a couple of years away from the hobby. Regarding the rat snakes, I would like to get your take on the mandarin rat, a laughing mandarina. I had done some research in the past and there was a lot of information suggesting that they can be very difficult species to keep and to work with having feeding issues and being difficult to handle. Was this just old information mostly based mostly on wild caught specimens? Well Brian, thanks for the support. Glad to hear that we got you back into the hobby. That's what it's all about. We're here to try and support people who are taking those steps, either getting back into it, who are into it, who want to um, tread new ground or, or, or achieve new things for themselves in this hobby. That's what this, this channel is all about. Your question half answers itself. Was this old information based mostly on wild caught specimens? Yes. So, years ago, we would get the Indonesian uh, and Asian sh uh, shipment list, species lists, um, and we would get Mandarina and we would get Molendorfi, and we'd get Radiata, and Subradiata, and what else? Bimaculata. So, radiated rat, subradiated rat, twin spotted rat, Molendorf's 100 flower rat snake, and Mandarin rat snake. And to say that these animals arrived rough would be a chronic understatement of just how poorly these snakes were. Um, the complicating factor for Molendorfi and Mandarina is that they really do not like high temperatures. So understanding back then was not what it is now and we didn't modify our husbandry appropriately commensurate to where they were from and animals that have got heavy um, internal parasitic burdens dehydrate at a far quicker rate anyway couple that with erroneous temperatures and you've just got a recipe for disaster so Molendorfi and Mandarina ended up with a reputation of being almost impossible to keep which isn't true um, so you know, I, I, I think that given the time and the development of this hobby, people that have cracked species, worked out how to do things, um, they have really been of great benefit to this hobby and opened up species that traditionally were written off as impossible and made them available for people to keep. So... Um, there's been a rejig with the families, so the the Mandarin uh, rat snake is now Eupripiophis mandarinus. The hundred flower rat snake is Orthriophis molendorfi. Um, I think Bimaculata is still in a lafe or a laf, however you pronounce it. The choice is yours. It's a dead language. Um, what was the other example I gave? Radiated rat snakes, a coelognathus. I think that's it. And then another one that we can group in with mandarinas and molendorfi as being maybe temperature shy would be the snakes that belong to a family called Oreocryptophis, which again was included in Alafia originally, and they're Porphyrsias. So um, these are the bamboo rats. So there's Latticincta, which is broad banded, um, Porphyrsia porphyrsia, which is uh, I can't remember what it's called in Chinese trinket snake or something daft. And the most popular exponent from that group, which is the striped Thai bamboo rat snake, which is Oreocryptophis porphyrsius coxi. These, along with the mandarin. Mandarinus and the Molendorfi do not like high temperatures. We do not want them to be above 26 degrees Celsius <clears throat> at the warm end. So 
what a lot of people tend to do is they'll have racks or whatever. They'll have an unheated bottom shelf and the snakes generally go on there. Uh, and that's how we would maintain them. Um, and that will uh, stop them from overheating. But we do need a bit of background heat there. It's, it's, it, I mean, they're, they're, they're super interesting. And they feed pretty, you know, as captive bred animals. Mandarins are, are pretty good snakes. They're chunky, solid. They've got large heads. They reach a decent size, just slightly smaller than a corn. But their head is far larger proportionally. The colours are off the chain. Uh, different localities grow to different sizes. Chinese locales, I think, are the biggest, if I remember correctly. Vietnamese are probably the most commonly encountered within private collections. Uh, the hundred flower is a large snake, six feet, massive coffin-shaped head. Um, stunning snake, that. Stunning. Far less commonly available as captive bred, though. Mandarins are relatively common for that sort of stuff. Um, you can find them, is what I'm going to say. Uh, and cock's eye are more common than both in captive bred form and all of them don't particularly like temperatures over 26 degrees so it would be in a reptile room these are intermediate level snakes even in captive bred form i'm not going to tell you the beginner snakes they're not um they they will occasionally throw up curveballs but if you're a established keeper i can't imagine that you're going to have a huge issue um, probably better in unheated boxes, bottom shelf of, of racking systems. They're quite shy. They don't like um, being overly exposed. If you're going to keep them in a viv, it has to be really well thought out. Lots of security, lots of places to hide. So, um, you know, that's how it's doable. Um, but I've always kind of defaulted to a a larger rack system box with the the, the the damp soils and core and sh slabs of cork to bury under and things and they always seem perfectly happy and consistently fed well the wild courts invariably all died they they were really difficult to get going truly worthy of an advanced level and given people have painstakingly had to break down these wild caught animals put them back together establish them get them up to condition breed them incubate eggs that they've never had to incubate before working on, on ideas of what the adults can tolerate temperature wise they've done really well really well and i doff my cap <laughs> um so th that for me it, is it you know that the, the wild caught there's no need to retread that ground i think that f too many people may approach it with arrogance and kill them and if the captive bred were available i would make full use of the people who have captive bred them and got them going mandarinus and molendorfi need to be more popular than they are we with the amount that passed away when people were trying to keep them it's definitely important we establish a captive population so i would encourage people to have a go at them maybe you know there's always this rush when we do next step or advance that we go boas or pythons and the colubrids fall by the wayside um and that for me is a great shame because across the breadth of, of, of the colubrids, there is so much choice and there is a range of difficulty. And we've seen how overexposure and flooding of markets destroys the popularity of certain snakes or the value of certain snakes and therefore whether they're still worked with and whether then they become disposable. When the, the, the rats and the kings and the, the, the weird Asiatic sort of rat snakes and the tiger rats and the dry marcon and dry mobius and the the uh the machete surveins and oh god the list goes on of stuff that we could be working with and developing populations with and um whether they're still in it mastercophis flagellatum the coach whips Kaluba constrictor foxi Kaluba constrictor constrictor 
I know this is going off on a tangent when you wanted to talk about mandarins, but it uh, leads to a greater example of where diversity is lacking in this hobby. And we could really be doing these snakes some favours by bolstering them, encouraging people to breed them, to work with them. Um, if you think that you can control your temperature, stop it reaching excessive levels, you're happy that you can maintain humidity, that you can allow a secretive snake to remain secretive without putting it on display, um, you know, then go for it. Because the world will always be richer for more mandarin rat snakes. Always. Especially if they're captive bred. Because as long as you don't exceed those temperature parameters and they're kept cool and damp, then the snakes seem to go from strength to strength and feed perfectly well. Uh, and they're wonderful snakes. And colour-wise, Jesus, you're talking thousands to get a boa or python to even get close. Realistically, for a good mandarin, we're talking about the colour spectrum and in intensity of gaboon vipers, rhino vipers, that sort of colour. And they're commonly accepted as some of the most intricate and beautiful species. And this is a little rat snake from China and Vietnam that you can buy nowadays for as little as probably, I don't know, 120 quid for a male, 150 quid for a male, and maybe a little more for the Chinese. But, you know, this is this is where we are. There's no, like, there's no real morph market in them. They just are what they are. They're a naturally stunning snake. People keep them because they're gorgeous animals. And they're not going to be high energy users, any of this stuff. You know, they tick a lot of boxes. So, yeah, my uh, my advice to you, uh, Brian, would be uh, go for it, buddy. Yeah, jump in. If you can get, get, get uh, a reliable source and you've got the infrastructure to keep them properly, then, yeah, the world's always better for more mandarins. We'll be back in a few days. We'll answer another question. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot.